this video, I want to talk about the concept of frequency response uh, in dynamic systems. So if I take an example dynamic system, such as a car driving down the road, uh, which here is being simulated by an, an MTS tester, uh, where it's applying a, a variable dynamic load to the input at the wheels. Now, this sort of dynamic load and the, and the components that uh, are subject to it then uh, may exhibit a dynamic response. So if we look at, for example, the McPherson strut, which is a, a commonly used suspension system in, the, uh, in an automobile, we would see that there's a lot of various components in here, and each of these components is going to be subject to the dynamic loading, which is being input at the wheel. Now, of particular interest to us is the strut assembly, which contains a spring and a damper, and that spring and damper uh, act to minimize the input from the wheel that gets translated to the car, which has the passengers in it. So we're going to look at that as a dynamic system. Now, as we've seen before, we need to figure out a way to, to model this system such that we can handle it. And, and one of the common ways to do that uh, is via lumped parameterization. So we're going to apply a mass, a dash pot, a spring, and then a surface. And the mass in this case is representing the car the dash pot and the uh, spring is representing our strut. And then this point on the other end is representing the ground or the ground and wheel together. So then our input to this system is that while the car travels along a road surface, the ground varies, and we're going to call that delta. So it has some displacement that is acting as an input to the system. And to make this a little easier on ourselves, we're going to approximate that input as a sinusoidal type input, where there's some magnitude and some sinusoidal frequency over which uh, the, the input to the car is varying. So to handle this scenario now, we're going to define a few states so that we can try to model this. So first, I'm going to call uh, the first state the unstrained state, which is basically where the spring is at a completely uh, unstrained or undeformed configuration. And we're going to define that the dash pot has a damping coefficient of C and the spring has a spring constant K. State two, we're gonna say that the state two is what we'll call equilibrium. So this is that the mass of the car has been applied, but we're in static equilibrium. The spring is strained under that load and the displacement of the car has changed by some value we'll just call x naught. And then finally, a third state is at some time. And at this time, the road surface has displaced. We still have our dash pot. We still have our spring, and the car body has moved, or our mass has moved, by some to some new position x. And this is defined at basically any time t, so we're just going to say that at some individual time. So using these models, we're going to construct some free body diagrams. So in the equilibrium state, we have the weight of the car acting down and then forces 
due to our dash pot and our spring. Now, because we defined this condition as static equilibrium, we're going to say then that the dash pot exhibits no force because a dash pot force is dependent on uh, the velocity of motion. The spring force, on the other hand, is equal to the spring constant times however much uh, we've displaced, which we defined as x naught. And therefore, from a, an equilibrium analysis standpoint, we discover that, well, the weight must be equal to k x naught. We'll do a second free body diagram corresponding to uh, the state, which co uh, corresponds to some any time t. And once again, we have the weight. We have a force from the dash pot, and we have a force from the spring. Now, the weight hasn't changed, so we can say, well, this is also equal to kx naught. The spring force must be equal to k, the spring constant, times whatever dis net displacement we have placed on the spring. So we have kind of three things going on here relative to our unconstrained state. We have the initial displacement x naught. We have the displacement of the car, which I've defined as upwards, so, so that actually reduces the force. And we have the displacement of the ground. We have a similar equation for the dash pot where we have the uh, damping coefficient c multiplied by the velocity with which the ground is moving and again the velocity which, with which the car is moving in a negative direction because it's going upwards uh, relative to the displacement of the um, dash pot. And if we apply Newton's second law to this equation, that the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration, what do we get? Well, we can take all of our force components. So we have minus w plus fd plus fs equals ma. And now we'll make some substitutions into this. So w is equal to kx naught. Fd is c delta dot minus cx dot. And fs is kx naught minus kx plus k delta. And this is all equal to mass times acceleration, where acceleration is just the second time derivative of x. OK. So, assembling our like terms, we can take all of our uh, components of this equation that have x in them and bring them over to the left-hand side. So that gives me fx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals c delta dot plus k delta because the kx naught terms cancel each other out. And this is a second order differential equation. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, here the process of solving uh, the differential equation. It would be rather involved. Uh, but suffice to say that if we focus on the steady state solution, we would get something of the form for the position x in terms of a sine omega t, mega nut t plus phi, where a represents the magnitude of this output position and phi would represent the phase lag 
So we're going to focus a bit on the magnitude at this point. And one thing we might be interested in then is the magnitude of this output position relative to the magnitude of the input position. And this would be called the magnification factor. Now, again, not working out or, or deriving the solution, but instead just representing it here, we get an equation that looks like this. And note that I've made a few substitutions in here, notably the natural frequency of the system, which is equal to root k over m, and the critical damping coefficient, which is equal to 2m times the natural frequency. Great. So that gives us uh, some measure. Now, it's not particularly nice to look at, right? But the few key highlights that we would want to take out of this are that the equation is a function of the damping coefficient c, and it's a function of the natural frequency of our system. So if I take this equation and plot it, I would get something that looks like this. Now I have a few things going on here. One is that the x-axis is the ratio omega naught over omega n, and the y-axis is my magnification factor. Now what we see is that as the frequency approaches uh, the natural frequency, the driven frequency approaches the natural frequency, we get possibly these large spikes in output. And recall that the magnification factor is a multiplier on the input displacement that is seen in the output. So we get these large potential, uh, potentially large amplitudes. And that's because we're uh, driving the system at resonance, which is uh, driving it at its natural frequency. But what we can also see is that as we increase the damping coefficient towards the critical damping coefficient, we reduce the influence of that spiked output at the natural frequency, and we can actually mitigate the effects of that um, by, by increasing that damping coefficient. So we get some sort of uh, output that, that looks like that. So let's take a look at what this might look like uh, in, in practice. So I have a little mass spring system here, and I can drive this system at a variety of speeds. Now, as I increase the speed of my motor, I can start to see differences in the output. So note that this is my input, and I have a second one over here with a rubber band just to show a little bit stiffer system and what that might look like. Note that my input corresponds somewhat well with my output initially. And so as I increase the speed, that changes, right? And I'm starting to see relatively large outputs as I approach the natural frequency. Now, if I continue to increase the speed of my motor, my stiffer spring starts to go crazy, but we actually start to see a reduction in the output of the, of the spring system on the right. 
So now suppose I take a recording of that motion and I'm using a little free software package here called Canovia and I'm tracking the input, which is the position of the, the springs up top, and I'm tracking the output, which is the displacement or position of my mass. Now, if I take a look at what this output looks like, I can see that I can measure or uh, record the input and I can measure the output. Now, the red line here represents the, the mass of the spring and the blue line represents the mass uh, with the rubber band. And I could make that comparison and, and, and measure that magnitude ratio that I'm getting at this particular frequency. Now, if I take a look at a different input speed, for example, I see that for a high rate of input speed, my output is very small. Now, my stiffer system over here on the left is, is going a little crazy, um, actually giving us a little bit of a Lissajou figure uh, in its output there. But the net result is that I see that at high frequencies, my magnification factor goes to zero, uh, which kind of confirms what I saw uh, when I plotted that equation. Now, if I were to collect a bunch of these videos at different input frequencies and calculate those amplitude ratios and then plot them, I might be able to recreate the magnitude plot. Now, this one doesn't look particularly nice or particularly uh, similar, uh, but if I collected enough data points, I might be able to get something that's um, relatively close to what I get from the theory. Now note here that my magnifi magnification factor is quite large and therefore I'm not seeing very much damping in this system. Now there is some damping but it's not very high um, and that would be kind of confirmed here. Now if I collected enough data I might be able to get a better handle on that uh, and what that might look like. So the key points here that we've seen are that for a dynamic system with this, with this uh, driven input, um, for example, my, my car riding on a, on a mass and spring uh, strut, we can predict what the output motion should be and we can possibly mitigate the effects of resonance uh, using the damper uh, and we can kind of see how that plays out and we can look at, um, for varying frequencies, what we would expect as, as the output. Thanks.